Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is a regularly scheduled meeting of the Sunderland Board of Selectmen. I apologize for the delay, but we were in the process of demonstrating on the moderator the chief's new taser. Uh, and it wasn't so much tasing that was the problem, it was the moderator's reluctance to come back around afterwards. <laughs> Tonight, uh, the chair, the ch chair, Mr. Pierce is, is uh, ill, and on that note, everybody, wash your damn hands, right? <laughs> it's still going around. Anybody with kids, anybody in the school system, anybody at work, it's a rugged bug out there. So please take care of yourselves and, and uh, your proximity to others. Tonight, we've got uh, a special arrangement, a special engagement with the police chief to talk about the budget. And we're going to amend some minutes uh, from a meeting past to some updates. We have a DLT request. Uh, believe it or not, it's caucus time coming up, so we have to have the warrant for the caucus available to us. Yay. Yay. <laughs> and uh, with that said, uh, Tom, anything to start the meeting with? Uh, just that the moderator just um, put in a new submission. He wants to have a taser <laughs> for crowd control at <laughs> town meeting. <laughs> so. so for people not using the microphone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so if you don't use the microphone. <laughs> See, there you go. It all starts here. Uh, we're going to start tonight with uh, uh, Chief Eric, and uh, we're going to talk about the uh, 2019 budget presentation um, and maybe a couple of public safety announcements. But I'm just putting him on the spot. There you go. Chief, thanks so much for coming in. And uh, we do appreciate the energy and effort, not just the presentation, but uh, what you guys do all year long. Outstanding. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, we'll jump right into it. We'll yeah. discuss the, uh, the, the regular budget, and then we'll do the capital expenses. Yep. Did you want yep. to? Yeah. OK, so looking at the regular budget, you see that um, overall, um, based on contract uh, negotiated items, the uh, the increase was about 5.6 percent. Uh, the increases in those uh, were about $1,300, or just over $1,300 in expenses. It was $1,600 in part-time police wages, uh, and 21,000 in full-time officer wages. A 9 percent increase on that. Um, I can break it down even further if you would like, or you want to discuss that at all. I can. The Expenses, we'll start with there. Uh, it's only $1,300. That <coughs> basically um, was an increase on clothing allotment. Um, the clothing allotment was a, a certain amount for part timers and for full timers, and we had to reflect that. The other increase was, where was it? Ammunition went up $50. Uh, so that's expenses. So that's the $1,350. Under the uh, payroll side of it, what you have there is uh, part-time increases of 1680, uh, and now that basically shows is the increase based on a contract negotiated item for uh, their yearly salary, uh, hourly rates for next year, and then on full-time, that shows not only a three percent increase, but also steps that were incorporated for the full-time officers, uh, not counting me. It's just the sergeant and then the other three full-time officers. So those added together um, uh, showed a $21,000 increase overall on payroll, uh, therefore increasing the payroll side, I'm sorry, the entire budget from 442 up to 468 and change. If I could pile onto that, Chief, yes. this is the this is the first year of the step move. Yes, where for people who weren't in, in, inside of the negotiations or, or clear with the police contract, there was a cola, a cola piece, but there was also a con an, ex an expansion <coughs> of the number of steps that were uh, in the system, and this move here reflects kind of the. This year reflects a move of um, people who have been in the department for some time. Future steps, we're going to take considerable <coughs> time to go through the steps. Uh, time was, I think when we first started, it was within, within five, five years. You were at the top step, and that was it. In this case here, we changed that from uh, five to seven, if I'm not mistaken. And in that seven, we've stretched out that, that mid-span in the course of the years. So. There was, a, there was a disparity that got corrected. The town is going to take, in this case here, the town is going to take 
the move, and I appreciate the uh, the, um, the associations, uh, policemen's associations, uh, willingness to take this across the entire contract instead of having it happen across one year. So we make all of our moves across this contract, and it becomes considerably more stable. And in the future, these moves are, frankly, they simply take longer. So in that sense, we're kind of stretching the accordion out, if you will. Right. So as we look at those, of course, your, your labor is a driver. The base here is a 3% increase. And then that, across, that goes across um, personnel for clerk's wages, uh, your contract, and then expenses are relatively straightforward. Now, the total here it looks like it's 25596 is what I have. Uh, yeah, only because I didn't have the current amount for the part-time, gotcha. sorry, for the full-time police gotcha. clerk. Yep. I put uh, the 2% in the non-union. So, so you've added for that. As a yep. start. As a baseline. Okay. Finance committee, questions about labor expenses? Tom? Um, just the chief and I um, have exchanged uh, information on the contract. The only... His contract. My his contract. contract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yours is coming too. The only reason we haven't uh, sat down to do the final uh, conversation is because the damn chief is out working. Yeah, I um, went and locked somebody up that day. I apologize. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Whose attorney was it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I'm sure we're, we're going to, I mean, most of his uh, concerns were uh, not monetary, so. We can address those. So right in that, in that the chief's contract for next year right now is a number that's a placeholder, but not anything that's been negotiated yet. Is that what I'm hearing? Correct. So you have, you're, you're currently working under contract. The number that's in here right now is this year's wages. This year's not yes. Got it. Yes. Right. Is yes. a placeholder. Yes. Right. Thank you. Just a quick double check. The, yeah. um, the, the expenses you said, uh, I had, you, you said uh, there was 1350 was clothing and uh, ammo increase. Yes. What was the other uh, thousand on that? Thousand? It's only $1,350. Oh, it says the expenses is going up by 2350 I think it's fuel, fuel added in with your expense Yeah, fuel line. is added into mine. So did fuel go up? This has a separate it's line a separate on that spreadsheet. I don't know why they break it out. So is it zero for fuel? For fuel no, I, I didn't touch fuel. Okay. So under, I have fuel listed as fuel, and let me see. So, so yeah. fuel stays the same at 12.5. Yeah. And this goes, so yeah, we have it go from uh, 31, to Right, I see that now as well. See the, the, the jump. In, oh, this spreadsheet reflects two thousand three hundred and fifty dollars of increase. Chief, your request is actually a thousand less than that. Well, my FY eighteen budget from the paperwork I received was forty five one fifty nine. Yep, I'm looking at that one right here. And then I'm only going up to forty six five hundred. So we've got a, a transfer on this three percent increase on this big spreadsheet. It looks like we have a. Okay, I'll take a look so at that. 45, one, <coughs> five, it's only one thousand three hundred and fifty. Right. All right. Okay. I'll take a look at that. Sure. Okay. Right. It's only a three percent. It's only mm -hmm. basically what the contract is on. What I noticed what, under the expenses is the, the town was able to give a little bit more a couple of years ago, right before it started, and that kind of put us in a in a happy place. Um, we did go up last year based on my contract, um, and now that I've moved. Uh, the expenses came back down. coming back yeah. down, but the 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 increase of the contract with the clothing allotment yeah. ate a lot of that up. Sure, so. that makes sense. Bob, any questions? Yeah. Just a clarification: the budget is going from four forty two to four sixty eight. Is that what I understood? Yes, total. Uh, That's expenses and payroll. That's expenses and payroll. Now, under capital, are there any 
Yeah, we're not there yet. Yeah, we're, we're headed there next. Next. Oh. <clears throat> I did a spreadsheet for you in your books. On this side? For, yeah. The capital in total? Yep. Okay. In total. Okay. Chief, you have questions about expenses? If not, we'll move on to capital. Good. Okay. So the, the first thing we're going to discuss on the capital is the, uh, and funny we led with it, was the taser uh, request. Uh, the tasers, uh, as you know, a lot of electronics or a lot of devices potentially one have a, a life history. Uh, and the end of life is, is <coughs> according to the company, uh, ending July 1st. And that's the, the taser that we carry. Sure. Um, we have three tasers right now. Two of them are... Will, will, will be six years old. <coughs> One of them will be five years old. And a lot of the things that they discuss on the taser is they will not work with equipment that old. Um, they want you to upgrade. So the upgrade uh, is either a giant cost. You buy the three or four tasers flat out and use that to you know, figure out that dollar amount. And I didn't do that because uh, uh, it, it's, it's a larger amount of money. This way, it's kind of like a leasing program. Mm -hmm. uh, they call it the Taser Assurance Program. They, uh, the dollar amount is about, I want to say about $1,200 and change, uh, $1,300 and change, and the other $1,400. So the total amount I requested was $2,700, $2,759. That is the cost for the first year of the plan, and then the holsters. Unfortunately, uh, with this, this poster that is holding this taser is only for this type. Uh, even the one that they replaced this with won't fit because that one is wider and you have to get this different. So each holster is about $100. Uh, and because we're changing the uh, equipment, we'd have to outfit the, uh, the holster cost. So each holster is about 100 Not everyone uh, carries uh, the taser, so we're not buying uh, a taser holster for every officer, uh, but the dollar amount for the first year of the plan plus the holsters, the total comes out <coughs> to twenty-seven fifty-nine. So does that turn into essentially a, a lease over the life cycle, or is that? Yep. So what happened is Taser has a basically a five-year plan, right? Because they don't want to continue with any uh, equipment over five years. They have this Taser Assurance Program. So with this cost. The, uh, the cost of the taser would be, like I said, about $1,300 for the, the, the set of them, mm -hmm. if we get three or four. We could even get five, but then that, that dollar amount goes, amount, goes up. Uh, and then each year, as the, 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 in the five years, the dollar amount goes less. So the next year's taser cost would be substantially less than this because the holster cost would, would be year one, and then that would be over. The taser buyout, if you will. So as you're going along, you can get batteries, as a, uh, a free, whereas right now it's seventy-five dollars per battery, and they last probably about six months, depending on the amount of charge or usage is used. Uh, outside in the uh, cold weather, drains them a lot quicker. Uh, if you have an accidental dis deployment, or you have an actual deployment, or um, you damage the uh, taser cartridges, this program will also give you a certain amount per year, so you're not paying for those. Mm. These right now cost about twenty-six ninety-five. Yep. Just for one. So if we order 10 of them, that's $269. Mm -hmm. um, and if you carry two per, that's only five tasers. Or you have uh, two for a series of three of them, then you have some backups in case you, you run out. Another big thing with uh, tasers that we haven't, I've noticed that uh, we have not been doing, is you should be qualifying with those and practicing with those yearly. Just as if we do so with the uh, pepper spray and with the, the actual firearm, you should be doing so with the taser, and they haven't been doing that. So we're going to continue with that uh, concept. So you create a usage once it wants to use a cartridge or charge or whatever. Yeah, you can't reuse. There's one disposable part. Yes, yeah. you can't reuse it. Uh, so it's good because it gets covered under their program. You get a certain amount of battery and cartridge uh, uh, supply without having to pay more. Uh, and we're, if we're going to be doing the not if, when we start doing the uh, uh, training with the uh, uh, tasers, or recertification, if you will, uh, those uh, costs for the uh, uh, training cartridges can be borne through that uh, you know, $1,200, $1,300 per year. Um, we could potentially 
try to eat the cost for next year, but it, right now it's too early to tell mm -hmm. um, or to, to say definitely. So I want to be you know, 100 percent open with you on this and say that this is obviously year one cost. Year two cost would be uh, about twelve or thirteen hundred dollars. So that would be substantially less than what this is. And, and that's, that's the good. first um, capital expense. Chief, is that that's a per unit cost or for the program? That's for the year. That's not per unit. That's and for the year. How many tasers is that? This, I believe, was four tasers. Four. Okay. Yeah. So it's basically about eighty-seven hundred dollars for four tasers for five years, and then we turn back in. Well, and that's the thing. So at the end of the five years, you can continue on their program, and they'll replace them. As far as the dollar amount, I don't know what it would be. Right, right. Uh, if we wanted to go out and buy the tasers outright. This taser, when it was new, was about eleven $1 hundred dollars, give or take. Um, the other tasers that they have are obviously a little bit more. Mm -hmm. They have this, the new version of this. Uh, it's called the X twenty six P, I believe. And then they have the X two and the X three. Um, there's different bells and whistles with each one. Uh, I've seen the X three online. I've never seen it in person. The X two, a lot of departments around here have that. The X26P, which is this, but wider, it's, the, it's the, the, the P version. It's like, you know, an iPhone 6 and an iPhone 6S. It's the same type of thing, just it's a little bit bulky. Um, and that still shoots this type of cartridge. Um, whereas, like, for instance, this here, um, this, is going, this one here in my hand is going to expire in a month. So if we don't use it, it's $27. Wasted, but you don't expect that. I mean, it's not every day that we're going to buy a set of these and think, okay, I've got two months to use this. I'm going to use it. Now, it's you want them to kind of expire, right? You know, because that means you're not using them. Uh, but you've given the officers the ability to use it as a as a, a tool on their belt, if you will. Um, and then the other one is going to expire in a few months. So we didn't replace these because why would I replace them if we have to replace the actual device? It's just a waste of money. So we're going to hold out until. Um, until July. So if this, if I could, this is maybe more internal, Chief, if this is gonna become a, a program, right? Mm -hmm. not, a, not a purchase with a life cycle, think about this like lease, and then it's a running lease. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't that be an expense as opposed to a capital item? Capital item, of course, is something we purchase and we own. Or, true, right? Yeah. I'm thinking about it from, pro, from, a lease, from a lease perspective or whatever. So, we're not going to own it, so it may be it may be that it's a it's a it's a cost and it's a cost shift from a purchase where we own we own the piece of equipment. Sure. Maybe this, and again, this could be an internal conversation. Maybe this turns into an expense, and we say, okay, we're going to get out of the business of buying this piece of equipment. We're going to own this lease arrangement, and then the benefits of the lease are blank. Sure. Replacement cost, life cycle end. Equipment stays it stays up to date, et cetera, et cetera. So again, yeah, well, maybe it's an internal conversation. We end up and it comes back as a different format. Not to question the need. I'm thinking out loud mm -hmm. and with my right hand. So I'm sorry. So maybe a, a brand new taser at best is two grand. Well, so I, I didn't look into buying a taser by itself. <coughs> I looked into the two options that they have. Right. They have the the the. They had the Taser Assurance Program and then the TAP 60, I think it was called. Uh, so five months, uh, five years and 60 months. Um, so they, they looked at different uh, aspects of that and you get a different life cycle with uh, how many batteries you can get, how many uh, cartridges you can get, and then you get the new Taser. Um, the only time I've ever purchased a Taser singularly, one by itself, uh, or an electronic control weapon, if you will, uh, was uh, at my other em employment, we, need, we only needed one more, so we bought the one. Uh, and that was about, like I said, $1,100, $1,200. I don't remember exactly uh, any programs back then, because it was either you buy this or you buy that, and there was only two options. Um, I don't think we would be looking at buying them individually. This would give us the ability to, to purchase three or four or even five, let's say, uh, middle ground of four. Uh, that way, when the two officers are on duty, each one has one. The other two officers coming in, if they happen to not swap out, uh, you know, I have it on my belt. I take it off. I hand it to you. You then wear it. Then you hand it to the midnight guy, and then he or she hands it to me. That device is being utilized 24 hours a day, uh, and it will eventually have some wear and tear. Um, having a cycle of three or four of them gives one or sometimes two of them some downtime. I mean, it's not being 
activate it constantly, but an officer should be taking it out, inspecting it, doing a spark test to make sure it is functioning, and then putting it back. And having a, a downtime of uh, a day or two sometimes would actually benefit the, uh, the device. So uh, long answer to your question, I apologize, but. Um, no, well, but it would be it, interesting to hear that capital right. cost of buying one outright. Right. Um, and how many times has it been used a year? So maybe the cartridges we buy a couple a year, maybe. So what I'm saying is, if we yeah. bought four of them, and at best they were two grand each, that's eight grand versus eighty seven hundred, maybe. True. So the question is, is that seven hundred dollar piece worth it to spread it over five years? Sure, I understand that. I think that we get um, more with a program like this because when you end up using mm -hmm. the cartridges, like I said, these are twenty six ninety five. I don't know what the other ones are. Right. The batteries, I can tell you, are $75 a piece. Uh, that may change with the X2 model. It may be different with the X26P model. That I'm not 100% sure. I'm sure it doesn't jump too far. Uh, there's other items with the Taser that we're not going with. We're not going with the, uh, the camera version. It drains the battery quicker. And then the officer, when they turn the Taser on, you've missed all of that other aspect of why you're turning it on. Um, and it was just, it, it wasn't working. If you, if you want a camera, then sure. there's a different feel that they, the company that does Taser, they deal with. And there's plenty of other companies that do it as well. Uh, so if you're really interested in the camera aspect, don't wear down the battery of this, put it on, on the body, and then you, that's a separate item. To, Sean, to Sean's point, if, it, if this was a quadrennial or every five year capital piece, like you could you could envision, okay, this is the year we replace four because sure. they all come up and here's my $10,000 request. Yeah. Versus 2,700, whatever, it's 20, 20, call it $2,800 annual expense, which is a different kind of category. But you're right, I mean, taking like looking at that from an analysis perspective, there's warranty work and parts replacement all built into a contract. That has value as well. Right? Oh, definitely. Right. Yeah. 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 I can get more paperwork from yeah. uh, uh, my contact with uh, with Axon, sure. the company that they're renaming themselves out of Taser, uh, and and uh, I'm sure they'll work with us and, and explain to us this is what you have to do or what what they suggest. Yeah. Everybody knows them as Tasers. Why would you change your name, right? Because they're trying to branch out to the cameras. I understand. And, I get it. I understand. The cameras don't shoot Tasers. Right. So. right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, thanks. Any questions with respect to that? Again, my first blush is if, if it's an annual contract, it's an expense. Right. Never to question the need, but yeah. we'll do that anyway. All right, that's fine. <laughs> next one? Please. All right, so the next one is the uh, bulletproof vest article. Um, I'm requesting this because uh, obviously there's a need. Uh, the officers wear their bulletproof vest. Uh, we replaced. Well, they started to replace uh, the first five or six of them prior to me being um, hired. There were some issues with trying to get reimbursement back because initially when you, when you do this, it's a, kind of like a grant program. Um, you buy your equipment and then you submit it to the DOJ and the DOJ, the Department of Justice, comes back and says, you know, prior to all of you, you know, purchasing it, they say this is how much you're going to be awarded. And then when you show them that you've purchased them and you, they've got the receipts to show the equipment and then the cost being spent, um, the federal government kicks back half of that. So, uh, you know, in this case, uh, I'm requesting $6,250 to purchase five bulletproof vests, uh, bullet resistant, if you will. So these vests uh, would replace existing ones uh, on the officers currently. The idea behind this is the DOJ's check would be electronically reimbursed to us. I don't want to give you an exact date, but if we purchase these July 2nd, there's a really good chance we'll have that money back in our account uh, come you know, no later than January 1st. Sometimes it's been seen a few weeks, sometimes you know a couple of months, but if we round up to a nice even six months, you're guaranteed at least half of this back. Uh, and then there's a reimbursement with the state. We then show them, hey, look, we purchased these, cost us this much money. The federal government has returned their money, and this is how much we've returned from them. We're requesting this from the state. And this is money that's already been approved through the budget cycle. So the money is there. At that point, they then back and forth, paperwork, signing contracts, um, and we get a check or an electronic submission back from them. So the money that the town has spent the last cycle, we have already received back. So uh, I asked Brian about 
what should we do with this? We have a bulletproof vest account. Mm -hmm. How do I get money into that account? Usually you get some type of revolving account or you set something aside knowing that that money will come back. I even went one step further and said, should I only request 3125 instead of 6250? Because we'll get the federal money back and then instead of us, we'll be in the red and then we're back at zero. And then when the state eventually comes back with the money, we'll be back up to 3125 and then that's money the town uh, will obviously use again for other reasons. Uh, and he suggested that we, um, it was some discussion back and forth uh, because the grant account is on this side of the books and this would be on this side of the books and it's difficult to go back and forth. So it's so, a mechanism of getting it out. You yeah. start with an appropriation and then you backfill. Yeah. yeah. So if, I've done this at, at my other job as well. It's, you know, you tell the town, yes, it's $6,000, but you're going to get at least half of this back. Definitely. And I always say that because you never know. Uh, I'm nothing against the Commonwealth, but what if they have to make cuts? And that's the first thing they cut. Um, but the federal government, we have approval for. Uh, we can go online and we can print that up and show you that we have the uh, $3,200 approval, uh, $3,200 and change. Uh, so, you know, I, I work with you here to see if you want to continue with that dollar amount or you want to drop it down half or you want to just leave it there. It's you no know, skin off my teeth. So we're getting life cycle here, Chief, right? They're getting towards the end of the life cycle? Uh, of this vest. And the yeah, vests yeah. usually yeah. are good for five years. Yeah. Uh, and these are for five officers who did not go through the program last time. Got it. Questions? Again, this is an expense, right? You're putting money away each budget cycle into this account that we talk about, and it builds up to whatever it is. Yep. And then we spend it and we build it back right. up again. So we never have to. Well, my hope is, is it, it, if there's any, if we get this money back, right. obviously, even if we get half of this back, is there a way at the end of the fiscal year that they take that dollar amount and put it into that account? Sure. Then I never have to come back and ask you guys for money. Right. Because that money's always sitting there, and that would be the account that we can go back and forth with uh, the federal government and the state government and get reimbursed for And then we never have to worry about doing one of these again. Because at, at no time, you know, we could try to outfit the entire department, 10 officers, 20 officers, and the federal government will say, yeah, good luck, right. we'll pay half of five. Right. So if you want to outfit 20 officers, go right ahead. We're paying for half of the vest for five officers. Right. You can bear the rest. Sure. Or like you do, you stagger them. Five here, five here. Right. If you have five more, five there. Right. So. To, to your point, Sean, we can talk to the accountant and see what the mechanism like that would actually look like, right? Tom? Uh, yeah, I would say for, because of the way the state does things, it'd be very difficult. The, fir the first the first year you try to do it, it's going to be difficult. Correct. Because there's nothing for them to transfer me. So at, at worst, you purchase them and you bring them back into free cash, you right. know, that money goes into free cash. Right. Can we allocate it back onto the account? Right. All right. But that's, that's, that's like when we used to have a, uh, a if you got, we used to get money returned when invest, you know, mm -hmm. from insurance. Right. You know, you're going to get a $47,000 check, but you still have to appropriate $47,000, yeah. although you knew you were going to. Yeah. It's a crazy way to do business, but that's the way the state of Massachusetts does things. We're a cash business. Okay. So I can understand what Brian would tell you that he'd probably rather appropriate the full amount. Yeah. yeah. And I understand it makes, where it's Well, coming. it makes it easier for him. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's also easier for me. I only have one account number where I have to t ask to I pay know. out. Right. right. It's a lot easier for him. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, Chief, anything else? Nope. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the next one, uh, we talked about the electronic control weapon, yep. and now I'm going to bring up to you the department handgun, uh, <coughs> the primary weapon that the officers carry on their person. Uh, the current weapon that I believe, from what I can tell from past purchases, uh, is over 10 years old. Um, as I put in, historically, firearms purchased usually last between 8 and 12 years without any major problems. We have been proactively assessing each firearm to ensure proper maintenance and functionality, uh, but know that each firearm will begin to degrade in the near future. You have different <clears throat> pins, different springs, different uh, levers that, that potentially run the risk of uh, wearing out. Uh, 
while the initial cost of nine thousand dollars, and that is the initial project cost, nine thousand, at the same time, uh, the actual dollar amount was I think eighty nine fifty or eighty eight fifty. But that is not counting the amount of money that we would receive back from the dealer that would purchase these weapons. Um, so we have eighteen weapons, and we're looking at with the purchase back of the current weapons that we have, it would bring that nine thousand dollars down to 5750 So if I could amend the 9000 down to 5750 That would be for how many? What's that? How many? Uh, so this would be for 20 weapons. The reason for that uh, is it would be 17 uh, duty weapons. So that means we can have, basically, if, if we can coordinate this the right way, 17 duty weapons would give us 15 officers with two as, as a backup in case there's a officer involved shooting, something goes bad and we have to send it back to um, the dealer to get repaired because right now we don't have any, I don't believe we have any uh, certified armorers. Mm -hmm. And when you start messing with the mechanics of a firearm, especially a municipality gun, you want someone who's certified as an armorer. Mm -hmm. I was certified in my prior job. Uh, that doesn't last every year. You have to keep going every couple of years. Um, and I didn't continue with that. Um, Besides, that was a SIG, this is Smith & Wesson, so I can't do that either. Uh, then on top of that were uh, the cost of potentially three, so 18, 19, and 20, uh, training weapons. And my hope and my goal is to uh, increase the type of firearms training the officers are going through. Uh, the, this first year or so has been kind of uh, back and forth um, as far as what we can do for training. There's one, uh, actual training that I, I used to take part in every year, uh, and it's called active shooter training. And state police and municipal police departments get together and train on how to respond to an active shooter environment, whether it be at a business or at a school, you train on that. And it's, it's above and beyond what the, um, above and beyond what the uh, uh, academy teaches. Now, some of the new officers and some of the new academies are starting to see some of that training, but the in-service or the, uh, the reserve training that they continue to go through every year uh, doesn't uh, allow for that. Uh, this program would also allow for a simunition round to uh, go into these training weapons. And then once we start getting this, this program going, the officers themselves, so Sergeant Lyons, uh, myself could be an instructor, um, Ed Chalik, we can go through and become instructors and then bring officers in on a monthly or a couple of months program where they can go through and, and, and study a shoot, don't shoot scenario. And here we're using uh, uh, simulation rounds, obviously instead of live rounds, because that would not end well. Um, so the simulation rounds, if those we don't know, are basically like a nine millimeter cartridge uh, filled with either a plastic bullet with, filled with either paint, with like a soapy paint, uh, or n filled with nothing. And you just feel the impact. Uh, the active shooter trainings that they have at some of the schools or the businesses also use the same type of rounds and the same type of devices. So that's the, the all-encompassing uh, program. It's, it's more than just the duty rounds. It's also, I'm sorry, the duty weapons. It's also um, incorporating a training venue into uh, the 20 weapons. John, questions? So this this actually is a you know life cycle. We buy it, we own it. Yes, as a ten year life cycle, pretty yeah, straightforward. Yeah, ten twelve year life cycle falls yeah. like straight into capital, just the way it should. Tom, uh, each officer has identified their a weapon for that officer, right? Each officer has an assigned weapon, correct? Um, when they're off duty, they take the weapons home with them, or they stay at the. Uh... They have the ability to take them with them because they're certified in it, and they can carry off duty or if they carry it on a detail. So they can take them home or they can leave them at the station. So they wouldn't be using them, if they're part-time someplace else, they wouldn't be using no, them? No, if you are employed by the town of Sunderland and then another town, uh, you only use that weapon in the town of Sunderland. Okay. Um, and I just worry, excuse me, I just worry about liability. Oh, most definitely. Yep. You know. <clears throat> yep. Alex? Yeah, so, so in that case, why are they not passed off like the tasers are? Um, well, <clears throat> the tasers right now are, are passed off because uh, as much as taser wants me to, I'm not going to assign a taser to every officer. 
uh, especially in a, a smaller town where we may not use it. A sidearm, the officers are qualified with that weapon. Um, sometimes they add different grips to it. Sometimes they add lights or lasers to the other ends of it um, because it, it, it adds to the officer being able to use it. Sometimes they, they enjoy using the, the light laser attachment. Uh, we have the same mechanics, the same um, uh, uh, sights, but the individual weapons go to each individual officer. So if, if you and I were coming on shift together and an officer, was, and we were relieving uh, one officer, then we'd have to have access to get a second weapon. Each officer has their own. So if, like in my case, and I don't bring mine home with me, I actually keep mine at the station, but if I respond to the station, I can grab mine, take it out of the, the lock, and then set myself up and then go to a call. Whereas if I had to get it from somebody else, um, I'd run the risk of me responding to calls with my own guns. Um, and back, I wanna say in the mid 90s, the officers started, officers, the department started getting away from having officers carry their own weapons. Um, when I first started, it was, okay, okay, kid, you bring your own gun, you get certified, and then, you know, uh, you come on. This way, every officer has the same weapon, the same magazines, the same rounds. Uh, they're not loaded differently, <coughs> not different grains or different um, uh, weights to the bullets. Uh, and uh, each officer has, a, like I said, a familiarity, familiarity with each weapon that they currently have uh, that may differ slightly with somebody else. Okay, so the tasers are basically everybody uses, or is used to the same kind of taser, and uh, the handguns, everybody likes their own special gun and whatnot. In, in some respects, the, the taser, there's no way to modify it. It's, okay. it's, it's a box, here you go, this is all you use. Uh, out of all of our officers, uh, the 14 officers we have, um, up until just recently, um, no? Uh, no, there's still one, one more officer that's not trained in it, but up until recently, there were four of them that were not trained in it. So these tasers were being passed back and forth to the officers, um, but those who were not trained in it, they, they were left locked up and the officers didn't use, utilize it because they weren't trained in that type of uh, uh, defense mechanism. Plus with the firearms, I would imagine if they're used in the, used for shooting or something, do they have to go off for evidence or something? Now you're missing well, that if you have an officer involved shooting, that weapon is taken. And then that's right. another reason why I mentioned yeah. having the, the two extras, right. because if that happens, you take that weapon that was used and then that officer can be reassigned a temporary weapon or reassign that weapon from that point on and then they would get qualified and trained through that weapon. But um, tasers don't follow the same protocol. <clears throat> they're used. Axon Taser would love that because it's fifteen hundred to two thousand sure. dollars per weapon and with fourteen officers we'd be spending twenty thousand dollars on tasers. Um, we're not gonna do that because um, I, I just I, I don't see that happening. I mean, you look at the state police; they just got a bunch of tasers, and a lot of the uh, the troopers are carrying tasers, but they're not outfitting every trooper. Um, with with Sunderland, you know, we're not going to do that either. I just I, I don't feel that that's a, a, a fiscally responsible. But to if I could maybe piggyback on something Alex had raised, the difference between the the two devices that we're talking about one is a longer life cycle, fewer replacement parts, something you would actually purchase. Whereas the tasers we started with, having a program is beneficial because of the inverse. The life cycle is shorter, the replacement parts are quicker, you're doing things like batteries, you know, we don't, we don't capitalize ammunition, that's an expense. Yeah. But the actual the gun themselves, we have capitalized in the past. We've actually rolled them all up into one warrant article. I remember that, that number of years ago, Tom, seven or eight, right? I, I, yeah, I remember when, when uh, they first Presented the police first presented the idea about tasers, right. and and a not every officer would feel comfortable with a taser. That, that as it was explained to us, some, I mean, because there's there's but it was <clears throat> it was presented as a way of non a non lethal. Um, it's an alternative. Uh, alternative. If, if if I show up at a scene and all I have is a firearm on me. I go from hands to gun. Uh, you want to be able to have a baton, pepper spray, hands, uh, and a, a taser. And, that, and that's huge. A taser, you've got a 21-foot rule anyways. So within 21 feet, you're able to defend yourself or stop somebody with the taser, and it's a less lethal option. Yeah. That's and, and, that, and that's all it was. And it, and it was, 
it was felt that the taser was something more that would be um, you would pass because they had a shorter life cycle than a firearm that they, they could be used by all the because if you had because you you wouldn't for the cost for use yeah. it'd be better to use them on every everybody would get yeah. to use it oh definitely definitely and and I know there's you know and again there's yeah. I, I hope you never had to use a damn thing to tell you the truth, but uh, I mean, because there are there are departments that don't believe in them. Mm -hmm. They don't, you know. There's other departments that swear by them. So, considering our staffing levels, is oftentimes when you're alone at a scene. Right. There are times where you are the only right. officer, and in you forget. You know, I, I've I've been to to calls. I've backed up officers on on calls off duty. And your, your arm goes down, and you're like, I don't have that taser. I don't have that, that, that extra tool to utilize. Uh, and you, you definitely get used to it, you know? Okay. All right, thanks, Chief. All right, and then the next one is the cruiser. Um, Always a cruiser. Isn't Always it? a cruiser. Mr. Moderator, you've been a moderator about 140 years now. How many what? cruisers have we bought? 141. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So this, uh, I put a placeholder in of, of 47, because I believe that's what it was last year. It was around there. Um, I'm still waiting to get a, a, a definitive quote from uh, Ford. The last quote I got was last year's pricing, uh, and that was at $30,000. And then the um, equipment for, you know, we're going to transfer a lot of, uh, of equipment over, but some of the stuff you just can't transfer. You know, we've... We've got radar units that are um, quite old, uh, so we need to replace those. And the radar unit, unfortunately, you know, you're talking about I think twenty four, twenty five hundred dollars just for the radar unit. Um, lights and, and the cages, uh, you know, this is a different cage. I'm sorry, a different cruiser than the one it would be replacing. So you can't take the cage out of that and put it into that car. So you have to buy a new cage. Uh, so things of like that. So the the equipment and the so. Last year we used Adamson. They did, you know, they did. The, they picked up their the cruiser, got paints, uh, graphics, <coughs> light bar, um, bars in the uh, the windows, the cage, uh, the back seat. It's that plastic mold, uh, and then the whole lighting switch. So from the light bar down to the lighting switching, uh, push bumper, all that stuff. Lights all around the car, uh, and that that itself cost about sixteen five, sixteen six. So that plus the thirty thousand two hundred for the uh, for the car equals uh, like forty six three or something, forty six four. Um, another sedan, chief. Uh, honestly, I'm thinking about uh, trying to get a quote for another SUV, the uh, the Ford Explorer that we have, um, one just like that. Um, it's the same frame as the Ford Taurus sedan that we have. Uh, it's just rides a little bit bigger and provides a little bit more room for the. Uh, uh, for the individual officer. I'm lucky, I'm short, so I don't need all that room. It's the other officers that are taller than me, which is m most of the department, um, and my daughter. Uh, they, they, <laughs> you tall people get to enjoy that, so uh, it gives you a couple of extra inches. And uh, gas is still the same on the sedan to the SUV. It's the same, everything about the vehicle is the same, all wheel drive, the only difference is that you get up just a little bit more inside room for, for the prisoner and for the officer. So it's the same platform. It's just a slightly... Well, it's an SUV, so you've got more room right, right. this way. So. You, were describing, you were describing engine, drivetrain, <coughs> all, 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 all that. That's, that's all this. Yeah. And where are we with respect to the remainder of the fleet, and that is their years? We were trying for a number of years to keep it at three, and that didn't work. We got to four, or that didn't quite work. We got to five. We could, the accordion collapsed a little bit. We were back down to four for a little while. Yes. This looks like it's uh, 2010 we're replacing. That's what's yes. identified. Yeah, so today the oldest cruiser is the 2010 Ford Crown Vic. Uh -huh. uh, and the... Um, yeah, the one that we did last year was a 2008. That was the uh, the fully marked, and then I okay. believe this one's going to be the uh, the 2010. That's the unmarked. Can, can can I ask Chief that you and Cherry get together and put together a list of the life of and the vehicles? I don't care about miles, just years and sort years. I can. That'd be great. We did. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, 
I say that because it's going to be a talking point at some point. And they, well, okay, how many do you have? How old are they? When was the last? It seems like we buy one every year. It's really probably every three or four years, but you know, it always seems like it's a cruiser a year. Not always the case, and I'm, I'm not saying it is. Yeah, no, I understand. But you know, it's like, well, well it was three years ago. Oh, okay. Well, and if I may, I mean, yeah. if, if say, say you have like we have, we have, uh, we have car one, two, three, we have four cruisers. Um, if we were to place one car every year. Uh, then by the next year, that first car is four or five years old. Correct. So the, the mileage on that car is anywhere between, this town's a little bit smaller, so the mileage would be less than what I'm used to saying. So let me change my math. So the mileage would be between 65 and 95,000, uh, give or take. Uh, and like the car I'm, I'm driving, uh, the, the Crown Vic, that's uh, V8. Um, Get up and go. It's yeah. a great car. It's also the last of the, uh, <coughs> the last of the dinosaurs. It's, right. a, it's a Crown Vic. There's no more of those. Right. 2011 was the last year they made those. So a lot of them that you see now, there are some V8 options. But to be honest with you, a, a nice V6 like the, the the sedan that we have now, um, the SUV we just purchased, uh, is 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 big enough. Sure. I think. I don't think we need something that's made for 91. Right. We're not on 91. You know, yeah, we're going to court, but we're not doing 105 of 91. It's not going to cover it, doesn't, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just go to Springfield and get passed all the time. Yeah. No, again, the only reason I say it, Chief, is, is having that, that base inventory and, and their, you know, their year, yeah. model year. I don't think anybody questions that Miles put on or any of that. I appreciate the, the move toward efficiency. I know we're going to get asked about getting a Prius, so we have to be prepared to do well, that. Well, I mean, I, we, we did look into a possible uh, uh, electric cruiser. Yeah. There are options out there. Uh, I've, watched, I've watched the Tesla video. Well, I, I, I wasn't going <laughs> to offer a Tesla. No, I wasn't going to be that. Um, there, there are... Uh, uh, Ford Fusion Hybrids. There's the Energy, I think it was called, yeah. with an I, not a Y. Yep. There's the Chevy Volt Cruiser, and then there is a special services pickup version. Sure. So yeah, the options are there. You know, so we could look into it as well. Great, appreciate that. Questions with respect to again equipment replacement. To me, the list is important. You know, how how are we on the list? If everything, if it'd be hard pressed to go to town meeting and say our oldest car now is four years old. Like, oh, okay. Well, wait a minute. What are we talking about that for? Does the newest, this new cruiser, the 47, include the onboard computer? Uh, this would, you, you just transfer it over. Uh, that includes the stand because the vehicle that's, that it's in now is the Crown Vet right. and that doesn't match right. the, uh, the, the seat and the uh, center console. So the computer will still move over. It's just a different stand. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Chief. So that's it for the police side. Now we have two for the public safety building. Um, just want to make sure I make that. Yeah. The building itself, uh, right? Yeah, this is for the building. So this, uh, the first one is the, uh, <coughs> the public safety complex camera system. Uh, we did, I did uh, request it to go through the Maya grant, uh, and the Maya grant did deny it, um, or went with another portion of the grant. Uh, and what this would do is, in, in this request, uh, $6,651. That would replace the existing uh, recording system uh, with a, a more up-to-date system and add an additional camera. The issue right now, if you remember last year I came here and I had a $22,000 request. Yep. That was everything all at once. Yep. You know, adding cameras, replacing bad cameras, replacing the video system, and doing all the key fobs all at once. Um, this is just, okay, maybe that was a little too overreaching. Let's at least replace the recorder. Mm -hmm. uh, the recorder is uh, on getting close to its last leg. We've had a couple of uh, cases where we've had to submit um, video and it was either good video and no audio or it was audio and no video. Uh, it doesn't happen all the time, but uh, it's, it's getting to the uh, life cycle to the end. That system that's in there now was put in when the building was built, 12 years ago? All that. Ish, around there. Um, I think we changed the cameras though. Cameras right. you did? Okay. Well, because so the original ones were black and white and we went to mellish color, right? Not all of them, but some of them, yes. Yeah, I remember we went from black and white to, to color. Okay, okay. 
so this, this cost here is for, uh, uh, like I said, a recorder, uh, would allow for uh, IP cameras and for analog cameras, which is what we have. Um, the reason for that is because if we decide to eventually start replacing cameras, by the time we do that, they're only going to have IP cameras, and then we're going to sit here and say, well, we just spent all that money for an analog system, and now we can't use it. Sure. Uh, so with this system, it gives you the option of doing both. And that's evidence room? No, nope. uh, um, this is sorry, just the... Room, sorry. Yeah, we did the evidence uh, room with uh, uh, last year. Yep. And thank you for that. Yep. That's up and running. I meant, I meant to say this is this is booking room holding cells. So, yeah, so th right, right now what this does is it does um, two cameras out back, yep. one camera up front, and then the booking room and then the jail cells. Got it. And an interview room. Yep. And then this would be an additional camera. <clears throat> I think that additional camera would most likely go out front and um, record the entrance or the front base of the fire department because we've only got the back base and not the front base. Questions with respect to that? Tom? Okay. Chief, one more? Okay, and the last one again is for the public safety building and it's a key fob door system. Uh, the key fob system that we currently have, I came to you last year and told you, you know, it. May or may not work. Um, I've I've got the the software up and running, but it's not communicating properly with the hardware. We did replace a couple of different batteries, small costs that we could pick up that we could eat, um, and not come to the town. Uh, and uh, one of the readers in the back uh, is not reading anything. Uh, we do have luckily some uh, key fob devices themselves. Keys. So, Actual okay. keys, yeah. So the HID keys, this, this is basically the proximity reader. So this proximity card would be utilized for uh, the exterior of the building and then getting into the fire side or the police side. Um, and uh, uh, so I've got the system kind of limping up. So I basically uh, gave out one of these keys to another <coughs> officer. Uh, between that officer and myself, we try it a couple times a week. Uh, I have found that this key will let me in to one of the doors in the police side once a day. And if I try it a second or a third or fourth time, it won't open. So once a day, I can get in. Um, on the other door, about two times, and then it finally says, no, no more. Um, the back door won't let me in at all. So uh, that system was purchased, again, when the building was built. Um, nobody can tell me exactly when it stopped working. Um, I've been there almost two years now year and a half, uh, and it's never worked then. So I can tell you at least a year and a half, maybe five years. Um, the great thing about a key fob system is if the town decides to go to do one for town wide, then you don't have to worry about people making copies of keys and sure. then someone leaves or you get rid of somebody. It's just a key fob. If you get rid of somebody, you just disable the key and then you fly the system. So if they try to use it, you look back to the cameras that you purchased and say, hey, that person tried to enter a building where they're not allowed. And it's 2018. Right. It is 2018. That cost uh, 7450 And again, these are building specific. Yeah. Yes, building specific. Tom, what do you think? Is that just for the uh, police fire or fire also? This would be uh, police and fire. It's not just police. That's why I labeled it under public safety. Or do you still, would they still use a keypad on the fire side? I think they, uh, when I talked to the fire chief, he liked that idea of having it uh, in case someone jumps out of bed and runs to the, you know, because they get toned out. And right. if they forgot their keys and it wasn't on their car keys or they took their other car and right. they showed up, how were they going to get in? Sure. So they wanted to keep the keypad, maybe mm -hmm. change the type of pad, but the other access of the building. So the front, the back, and then the inside, um, uh, inside hallway. Uh, we could even go as far as uh, uh, try to see if we can get a different type of system and try to do it to the uh, gym. And then now we now you've got uh, 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 like a, a checking in of who's utilizing the gym. Sure. So when you come in and find, you know, uh, somebody didn't wipe it down correctly, you can say, well, you know, John Smith used it or Eric T. Metropolis used it. So. Okay. Why not uh, keypad for everything instead of using the pub? 
Well, the keypad is great for coming into, say, one door. And then, but if you're doing it from one door to the next door to the next door, I think a key fob has a little bit more accountability. This I can program in four different settings. <coughs> Whereas if I have seven doors, either everyone has the same code to get in all seven doors, and then now I've got you walking through the police side and I'm walking through the fire side, and there's no accountability. Um, they've got electronic keypads where you can go through and program um, individual numbers. So you get a four digit number and you get it and we can do that. And that's great. But when you leave, um, sure. whether it be on good terms or bad terms, I have to then go in and deactivate, deactivate you. you. Whereas a key fob key, I'm issued, you're issued a key fob. You yeah. lose it, you break it, I can replace it, no problem. You leave because good or bad terms, I just check a box and hit save and it's done. Uh, ease of use for the uh, individual, for the people programming it. A uh, little bit easier tracking as well. I can pull up on the system and see that all my police officers came in at this time and they exited at this time. If you have an enter and a, and a pass, enter and pass key. A keypad system where you type in the code, I, I haven't seen one, where I can then download Okay, who used what code, and that means so you used a four-digit code, you came in, and then you used your four-digit code, and I, I haven't been able to see that. Okay. I've only seen the, the key fob has that type of program. That's the, uh, the locksmith at work, many, many of the different labs, will, they'll, they'll ask for the keypad, thinking they'll be, they're more secure, mm. and the locksmith always tell them that your key, the key is better than... Um, it's more secure than the uh, keypad because yeah. usually it's a keypad if you look around like it and somebody's written the code down yeah uh, well they have because they'll they, they, they themselves forget it so like the code is usually i i found two nearby. places in the public safety building where i had to either erase wash or paint mm -hmm. over yeah. a code yeah but i it, i it's because i i would i would think the same way you were just talking yeah, to sean and 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 they and uh, they they they'd rather the locksmiths rather see you use a a key yeah. versus a the, keypad. The the other uh, aspect for the public safety building, we have that rear door, and and we haven't had a, a overabundance of use of it, I think, but we have a, a conference room that we want to utilize. And if we wanted to, and we have a, an active key fob system, you know, you came in and said, hey, listen, I, I want to. Uh, request to use of the conference room for Tuesday at six. We issue the key fob and say, yeah, when you're done with it, drop it off with us, they get you in. And we only program it for Tuesday from five minutes to six or 10 minutes to six until whatever time. And then the next day, it's dead. Mm -hmm. So when you try to use it again, you can't use it. The system that we have now is a key. I give you that key, unless I go and buy the key that has the inside set up where you can't make a copy of, mm -hmm. or if you do, it's an $18 key, uh, you're not gonna go to the trouble of making an $18 copy. Um, so I, I, I like the electronic side of it. Um, you have uh, accountability, and then if you start using it for, uh, uh, say, rest of the building. If you decide to say, uh, not just building, the rest of the town, uh, you wanna do it to the library, do it to the town hall, do it to DPW, then you can get a system that uses an HID system it doesn't have to be the same company. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, you can program these keys that work in multiple buildings. And that's it. Question with respect to operating or capital? Tom? Let's go, screw. Chief, you get 30 seconds for the shameless plug. Shameless plug. <laughs> uh, no shameless plug on my end. Uh, I thank you for your time to, to, for having me here. and. Uh, uh, thoroughly enjoyed the last year and a half, and I look to uh, uh, hopefully a lot more than just that. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. One question. Yes, sir. On the vest, is it mandatory that the officers wear a vest? Um, it's not in the policy that they have to wear it, but a lot of the officers are going to a more comfortable fit, and that is an external carrier. So it looks like I have a uniform shirt on, but it unzips, and this whole thing can come right off, take it off, so I'm sitting at my office, I'm not sweating, and then when I get back on, I put it back on, I put the strap on, and then zip it up, and it looks like I'm in uniform. So a lot of the officers are going to this, because it's easier. Sure. You can go in and out, you can, you can work in the, uh, get my baton in my, right? 
rib system. Um, so that by itself, you don't just wear this without the vest. So even though there's no uh, a, a policy that says you have to wear it, this kind of makes it that way um, uh, without saying it. But some of the officers uh, that haven't changed for this yet uh, still wear their vest. So everyone still wears it. Uh, what I've seen in other departments, when you have a force policy where you have to wear it, uh, there's no delineation between on duty and say details. Um, and you would think that when you're on a detail, in the winter, obviously, but in the summertime, you're sweating, are you really gonna wanna wear it? Well, you know, you can be just as dead if a car hits you, you get shot at because you're out in the open um, for the world to see. So if you're gonna wear it while you're on duty, you should be <coughs> open. But that's just my personal belief. Great. All set, Bob? Great, thanks so much, Chief. Have a great time. time, I appreciate it. Thank you, you guys have a great one. Okay, next up we've got amended minutes from 122-18. Uh, and the amended minutes, I'm curious what the amendment was. Just a clarification of. Uh, oh, and the, so it's the last sentence of the first yeah, paragraph. Right. Tom, I wasn't at that meeting. Is that capture what you were looking for? Or the. Uh, Who was looking for? for? Lauren. Huh? Lauren Starr. It was just a statement that she that we clarified um, that the library depends on privately raised funds to meet a substantial portion of the state materials expenditure requirement. Thank you, fellas. Appreciate it. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Um, she may have said that. I don't remember it being said. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So I don't know. Confirm on tape. I I I don't specifically. I, I I read that the other day, and I don't I don't remember those. I know and and see now, when you've been on the board for a while, there's good and there's bad. Right. Now I know things like this have been said. I know specifically this has been said in the past. Yep. I don't know if it was said at the last meeting. Though. Okay. I'll go check the video. Okay. You know what I mean, Scott? Yeah, I agree. I know we. I know the library trustees have said that mm -hmm. in the past, especially when we went to shortly after the override. Right. But I don't know. Sure. And if it, if it's reflected, if the minutes would actually reflect that meeting. Sure. Yeah, and, and, I, yeah, and that's really the purpose of the minutes is to reflect the meeting. That's a public record. Correct. I, I just, you know, so, so if you ask me if do I know that that was specifically said, yep. I guess I wasn't. Okay. Let's just, just have Sherry check the tape and yeah. grab it. Yeah. Great. No trouble at all. So we'll have those for our next. Uh, I have minutes here marked 129, but I don't see those here. So, so you said you. Oh, you yeah. Yeah. Now, were you here at that meeting? I was here at that meeting, but, you know, we'll go back and we'll double check it. Do you remember it being said? I remember the discussion about about how the how fundraising. I remember the discussion about fundraising. I'm not sure about the allocation in total, but I think it's important to capture. But I thought I thought. And, and, and again, I could be wrong, but I thought I thought our budget, the budget they produce, covers the expenses that that are required by the state. I didn't know. <coughs> if I'm not mistaken, some of some of the funds that are raised as part of the annual campaign are for circulation, and that's part of the or for excuse me, not circulation for. A house materials, and that's part of the formula. Yeah, but I thought that was in addition to the minimum. I didn't. This this says that this, this, if it wasn't for private fundraising, right. they wouldn't meet the state minimum. That's the point to clarify. Right. Right. Yep. I thought. I thought our. I thought our. The voting, town's contribution. The town's county right. bu budget covers those expenses. Because I always. But if I don't, if I'm not mistaken, I, we're always told that we have to raise it by two and a half percent. That's right. what we raise two Thanks, and a half, Bob. right? By two and a half percent, right? Yeah. So the question, uh, if I could, but I know, back I know they, I know they raise. I know, I know they do a lot of fundraising. A lot of fundraising. But I thought that was over mm -hmm. and a, beyond the two and a half percent increase. So the risk is if fundraising goes south one year. Uh, and we don't meet the appropriation to jeopardize the formula. Correct. And that's that's the point to, to find out. I agree with that. Okay. Yep. 
I'll double check the yeah. video. And I'm yeah. just, I apologize, I forgot to yeah. put the 129 minutes in your. They're just I minutes. I just forgot. That's all right. So, so no, but to, to, your, to your point, Tom, it, that's an important piece to have a clarification. If the town's minimum appropriation, if the town's annual appropriation isn't meeting the minimum portion that is the match for MER, right? And we rely on fundraising. Then, what's the risk going forward? And that's Correct. I think that that's an important piece to have clarified. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll, town, go back, I'll go back to my other budgets, but I always thought we we always were raising at two and a half percent. Right. So to meet the formula. To, to, and and I know after we failed to failed override, we weren't meeting at two and a half. But I would say wasn't. There was a couple of years of waivers, and then we were able right. to get Wasn't catch it, back up. I, I don't think it was what maybe four, or five years ago. I, I specifically remember mm -hmm. that we were no longer requesting a waiver. Correct. Right. Yep. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, there was like a four or five year period where the waivers were. We we had a we waiver, had waivers, but right. then but it was like four or five years ago where we no longer Started back had the, the waiver. System. That's right. So the the risk is if it's all driven by um, raised. And appropriated, then it's a program that's important. If it's raised by fundraising and it's part of the formula, where's the risk in that? And that's that's we need to clarify that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. <clears throat> okay, great. So we'll hold off on the minutes of one twenty-two. Um, yep, yeah. and then one twenty-nine we'll hold off on. And um, next up will be some uh, selectmen's updates. Tom, you good? Anything cooking this past week? Um, let me think. The um, South County, we got South County's budget, mm -hmm. right? So that's in. Um, they're still building the building across the way, although we don't know anything about it. Well, that's good. I went by the other day to, to get doors on it, so that's good. Um, and windows. Um, South County... Uh, the the senior the senior center is 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 doing very well. Um, the, back on the South County ambulance EMS. Um, I at the next meeting I will be proposing that members of the board of selectmen get off the South County EMS board of oversight. Um, I think it's. Um, we're at the point now where it shouldn't need the day-to-day -day guidance of three members of boards of selectmen in it. So not to say that you exclude selectmen just because, but I think if there's people, other people that are interested in, mm -hmm. in you know, serving on that committee, that we should we should entertain those. Is that going to run into agreement modification? No. No. Okay. No. There was nothing. About the composition of the oversight. No, board. in in the original, why there was one one segment from each town, um, although there that was never the case. And initially with Whiteley, Whiteley had uh, two members that were not one one wasn't member of the board of selectmen. Um, Sunderland and Deerfield had, and that was more as a fiduciary responsibility oh, okay. to the town during its initial start up. Right, I remember that. That, yep. that that's why yep. when when Mark. <clears throat> Gilmore and myself, we thought it would be important that way because um, there was questions about, you know, expending money and who was controlled. So sure. But now, I think the, I think the budget is more stable. You understand what's in people understand what's in the budget now, um, and and again we we were working off from state and federal grants and there was all kinds of stuff in the in the initial thing. So it was. It was it was more difficult to help pertain that makes pertain sense. to the to the town, but now I think it's it's becoming a more accepted. This is what it cost, and it's more transparent today than it was when we first started. So <clears throat> we'll see where that goes. <clears throat> Anything else? No. Nope. Uh, last week I was I was not at this meeting. Uh, there was a scheduling issue and I was actually at the Frontier Capital Working Group <coughs> meeting uh, and that's a composite group that's been put together to to help understand I think not necessarily the need for capital work at the Frontier um, this being the building's grounds and some of their equipment but the 
understanding of the mechanisms to uh, pay for long-term capital uh, needs at Frontier. Now, the current proposition is to simply go out and ask for a bond of a particular value, and that value is a bit dynamic. And the question the working group is, is working through, every pun intended, was, uh, is um, what constitutes uh, not just the need, but the mechanism to pay. Now, it's important when you talk about capital and borrowing, what can be infilled with borrowing, the creation of capital stabilization. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a many pronged, it's a, it's a many pronged uh, problem. So the working group is, is last week, last two meetings has spent some time of talking about oh, a variety of things. You know, is, is a building uh, being uh, modified? If so, does that constitute a capital? Is the replacement of stair treads capital or is that a maintenance and major maintenance? And it's important to bear in mind that as our budgets have been tight for, God, as long as I've been participating in local government, uh, you know, ca things like capital and maintenance are the oftentimes first to get squeezed because we're covering things like payroll and <coughs> benefits and services to the public. So I can, I'm empathetic to the notion that the uh, frontier uh, building and grounds sees a lot of hours. So in, in, in the business, it's called contact hours. Those buildings see a lot of contact hours. And there are things that have to happen. Uh, the concern expressed by uh, many in the group and the dialogue uh, has been really um, productive. And that is not to uh, parcel out, you know, what window needs to be replaced versus what window needs to be, uh, have, have uh, caulking that's overly simple, but really how is it we go about a sustained funding source and a in to internal plan for maintenance, major maintenance, and capital. How do we pull all that apart? And we saw this last year with a warrant article, and there was a, a short list of things uh, on the warrant article, and the appropriation dialogue discussion came down to, well, why do you need a lawnmower? And we want to, I think, avoid all of that and hopefully establish a, a, a program. Uh, there are going to be some uh, warrant articles coming forward this year from Frontier on capital items. I think that makes perfect sense. That's one mechanism that can be used for funding. I also think that a borrowing authorization is probably in the pipeline. I, I I'm suspect that that borrowing authorization is going to be refined as this working group hopefully uh, begins to come together and advocate for uh, the appropriate mechanisms for funding capital and, and major maintenance at Frontier. I know it's long-winded, but it's really interesting to kind of pull apart what's going on with deferred maintenance, what great things are happening at the building, not necessarily with the education part, but in the maintenance and upkeep of the building, and there's a lot to it. So that's where I was last week, and I'll be there again another couple of weeks. Um, if I could, Scott, sure. one, one thing that I, that I did don't want to forget is that the first Thursday of the month, we always have the uh, the Sunderland um, 300th anniversary committee oh, yeah. meets, yep. and I just you know the one of the big weekends that that are that's coming forward is the uh, uh, June 15th, 16th, and the 17th. Uh, June fifteenth is uh, Sunland Elementary School performance, the Sunland birth birthday cake contest for children. Sunland Youth Baseball okay. will be selling hamburgers at that. Uh, nice. On Saturday, June sixteenth, uh, there's going to be live music and breakfast station sponsored by the Sunland Women's Club, Farmers Market, Crafters, and that's going to be from nine to twelve. 12 to 1 dance and karate demonstrations and then at 1 to 3 is, is a parade starts so that's just if you want you may want June 15th June 16th June 17th is going to be a large day uh, June 16th is the parade 1 to 3 um, 3 to 10 there's going to 3 to 10 there's going to be food beer and wine tent live music crafters children activities tethered hot air balloon rides uh, cow, cow chip bingo, um, sheep, sheep uh, herding demonstrations, etc. 
And there's also going to be a fireworks display that night at 930, which will be down in the center of town. And then that Sunday, June 17th, is a day long. The firemen, uh, the, the fire department sponsored a, a number of activities. So you can go on and you can get this um, off the uh, web page, uh, Sunland web page. So you can go in and look for the activities. And a lot of things are will be listed there. But that's fast approaching. Nice. Yeah, it is, it's February. We're talking about June. And it was two years ago we started talking about the 300th or more. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it's quick. Nice. Sherry, what's been cooking in the office? Um, budget stuff is ongoing. So I'm, as information becomes available, I'm updating the sheets and the revenues. <coughs> I have the capital pretty much all put together for you as well. I'm waiting for bids to come in for some things. Mm -hmm. um, and wait, still waiting on the school budget. Big pieces are still missing, so. Nice. It is that season, isn't it? It is. It comes right away. If I could back up one more thing, I was, again, I missed, I was at another meeting last week, but we did, and I hope, I'm sure it was mentioned, uh, that the certification by uh, DHCD of the 120 North uh, project, that's a big threshold. Okay, uh, next up we got the DLTA request from the COG. Seems like they do this every year. Oh wait, they do this every year. And the goal tonight is to share and look at this, uh, mark it up, and when's our effective date for return to them? January 31st. Oh good, <laughs> so we're right on time. <laughs> Tom, do you want to take time and do this uh, offline? Do you want to do this tonight? Yeah, I think we should uh, look at this offline, Scott. Okay. Can we uh, can we commit to having it available for next meeting That's so we fine. can actually submit to them? I know that it's it's date sensitive, and it's to send my apologies to Phoebe and Linda. They did send um, an email um, explaining a little bit more mm -hmm. about how they would like you to rank them. Okay. Uh, by category, and I think it's one through five. Okay. Um, yeah, top three to five planning projects. So, okay, so homework like legit. It says one twenty nine on it. We're right on time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up, we have a approve a caucus warrant, and um, if if uh, people. Uh, want to come and participate in the caucus. It's going to be here, March. Uh, Citizens Caucus is going to be on March 5th at 6.30 in this space right here. Uh, this is your primal democracy right here. This is your chance to get people on a ballot through the caucus format. Uh, don't let the news do it for you. And uh, don't let the vast minority of participants in the town do all the work for the vast majority of people. So our caucus is on the 5th. We have the following slate. Uh, we have an assessor for one, uh, one assessor for three years. We have one board of health member for three years. There, is, there are three library trustees for three years. There's a moderator for a year, and we established that Bob's been the moderator for 140 years, and he said yes. And we have planning board member one for, I'm sorry, yeah, one for five years. There's a cemetery trustee, Riverside Cemetery, single position for three years. There's an elementary school. There are two elementary school committee members. Those are three-year terms. And there is a selectman. Uh, there is a selectman. We do this every year. One select board member for three years. Uh, that's our warrant. I'm going to vote to post, Tom. Motion. I'll second the motion. Uh, again, this is your town caucus that's held here at March 5th. That's held at 6.30 p.m. And it's your chance to put people on the ballot. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Two to zero, please. If we didn't vote for that, the town clerk would have something. The town clerk would be mad at us. <laughs> exactly right. Um, as our, as our, before we move on to the next piece, letter of support for regional digester, um, as, as our budget piece is coming forward and developing on the expense side, that's our annual operating budget. Um, and we have a pretty good charge of capital work coming forward. I think it's really important to have the discussion very soon about another ballot question, certainly if not one for debt exclusion for a half a million dollar fire truck, uh, to revisit the growing gap or the continued gap 
between what we have for expenses in the town of Sunderland, your town, your services, and what you pay for those services. And that is going to devolve, again, another override discussion in my mind, and certainly at this table. And I'm speaking to an empty room, and I want to thank everybody for coming to tonight's budget deliberation. <laughs> so when you hear the word override, you can start filling the seats, just like when you hear the word uh, North Main Street, or when you hear you know, the word there's a bear sign up the road, or you hear any of those other things. Your budget for your services that you pay for is an active discussion all year long. We're going to have another override discussion, and that's going to happen sooner rather than later. So don't wait to participate in the dialogue. Thank you. I can do that because it's, you know, I'm coming to the end. Okay, we have a letter here about a digester. It looks like the digester um, from the information that uh, Warner Brothers through Rich Bren Brenda's looking at, it looks like the digester may be something advantageous for the town of Sunland. So it's a non-committal letter. Yep. Um, I don't see why we wouldn't do it. From a regional perspective, it's, <coughs> it's, it's interesting. Again, uh, solid waste digestion is just frankly a, a, a well-vetted method for dealing with solid waste. When we deal with sludge, and it's important that we find a way to deal with it. Scott, we'll get, I, I mean, every year when we put together the budget for the, for the wastewater treatment yep. plant, one of the, the most difficult items that we have is sludge disposal. Because yep. we never know yep. what's going to happen. Where it's going to go. Because it, it was 20 years ago, every, every place in Connecticut along the Golden Coast, yep. they, had, they had incinerators. So right. you could always bring yourself down there. Yep. And now, and now and, and there's an incinerator in Fitchburg and... And there, there, sure. and there was a, and everywhere you go, there were people at wastewater treatment plants that had incinerators. Now, no one. No one, right? Yeah, it's or, important. Or very, very few. So now, it, and so, so how do you, how do you get rid of the sludge? It, it's right. the digest digesting solid waste seems like a such a very smart. Solution. Right. So and it's important people bear in mind that this the loop isn't completely closed. There's digestion, then eventually there's either land incorporation or, or other use for the solids. And again, we truck to a we truck to a, an incinerator about if we're on a good day, twelve percent solids, which means you get eighty eight percent water that we're taking and we're trucking to actually incinerate. So <coughs> you're trucking eighty eight percent water to burn it. So anyway, digestion at a regional level makes a great deal of sense. It's not something we could certainly do. I, I applaud Greenfield for taking the initiative and, you know, make no mistake about it. There's, there's, there's lots of different motivations for doing it. Well, it, a, a, it helps, it, A, when there re, is, there's regional cooperation, right. there's different financing that can become available, that becomes yep. available and yep. different methods of getting, rounding up that money. So, right. No, it makes great sense. Okay, uh, you want to want a uh, motion and support letter of support? No, you're going to do one more thing. I'm going to do one more thing. No, I'm I'm a, for the digester. Oh, I, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Motion, motion for uh, second the motion letter of support for the digester. And all those in favor? Aye, aye. That's uh, two to zero, please. Okay, next up we got a fire department birthday celebration, the sixth of uh, February. Wait a minute. That's tomorrow. like tomorrow. Yep, you missed our invitation yesterday, uh, last week. Five thirty to six thirty. It's at the public safety complex. Tom, since I missed it, you want to you want to weigh in on some more details? Uh, we were invited by uh, uh, Mike Zioli and Jim Balunas. They came in in uniform. Nice. Um, and the birth the the fire department is going to be according to the the fire department's historian Jim Balunas is going to be eighty five years old on. <laughs> Tuesday, February 6th. So everyone is invited down from uh, 5.30 to 6.30, see the trucks, the equipments, have some cake, and learn about the fire department. So come on down to the fire department tomorrow night between 5.30 and 6.30. That's wonderful. And thanks, Jim, for uh, the, his the historical work and the de fire department in general for not just being available as a resource when we absolutely need them, but for being an important part of the, the, one of the many threads, the fabric 
of our community. They do a great job. Okay, anything else? No, Scott, Scott. Uh, not hearing anything else, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Call us out at 8.04. FCAT, thank you as always.